Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the revelation of your love. Thank you, Father, that you continue to reveal unto us the extent, the width, the length, the depth, the height of your love. And in this lifetime, Father, we have come to know more of your love. Before we were in you, you, we have known your love, but now we know your love so much more. Thank you, Father, for the revelation of your love. And we ask, O God, that we will continue to be transformed by this revelation. And you continue to build your perfect church in that which you want to build into us. Let your glory be revealed. Let the spirit of wisdom and revelation come upon each of our hearts and minds that we will know the fullness of your love. We know the hope of your calling, riches of your hand, and the saints that sin grace of power towards us to believe. We thank you, Father, for the quickening of your spirit. Even now, Father, quicken, transform, teach, guide, lead, establish us in you. For all that you do, we give you all the glory, worship, and honor. Thank you, Father, that in you all things are already done. And we just bring forth on the earth what you have declared. So let it be unto us according to your word that is written of us. Let that which you have established and purpose for this life on earth for each one of us, let it be done. Let it be so as you so determined in the archives of heaven. Thank you, Father God. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As is established, so let it be so. We are here to say the great Amen to your word. Establish your word and glorify Jesus in our lives. We give you all glory, worship, and honor. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. amen. Praise God. Let's take off from where we have uh, left off uh, this morning. Look again at the book of Ephesians. And... Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 again. Ephesians chapter 1. And the passage that we're looking at again is uh, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, or in the Greek actually says, in the heavenlies, in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Notice what is happening here in verse 4. Sometime before the earth was even made. In verse 4. Before the earth was even made. In the book of Job chapter 38, it talks about how when God laid the foundations of the earth, all the sons of God rejoice. In Old Testament, sons of God refer to the angels and the spirit beings. And four times it's used in the Old Testament, the word sons of God. Three times in the book of Job, which refers to angels, and the other one in Genesis 6, which also refers to angels. And at the foundation of the earth, the angels were rejoicing. But it tells us here in verse 4, before, before even the foundation of the world, God has chosen us in love. God has chosen us to be some sort of instrument to personify, to glorify, to express His love. Every creation of God had a purpose. And all creation reveals God. In fact, Romans chapter 1 tells us that all the creation reveal the attributes of God. In the creation, we see the attributes and the power of God. And everything is about God's attributes and God's love. But from the beginning of time, how long ago was the foundation before the foundation of the earth, way at the creation of the universe. God has already reserved us zillions of years ago to reveal His love. 
And then according to the book of Ephesians chapter 3, hidden before the, from all the other ages. And it says ages, hidden from the ages. Never revealed before. During the age of the angels, during the age of various things that took place, God has never revealed. And even in the Old Testament time, in those ages, God has never revealed what He has brought forth when Christ came. When Christ came, even the angels desire to look upon that which the prophets prophesied. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Peter, even the angels desire to look into that. Because there's something about Christ coming and what the bride of Christ is to bring forth. We have been called to reveal the fullness of the love of God. We pause for a moment. Who is Christ and what is Christ? Christ was the image of God. Christ was, Hebrews chapter 1 says, the hypostasis of God, the substance of God. What does Christ personify? The love of God. In Christ, we found power. In Christ, we find energy. In Christ, we find authority. But the most important thing is, behind His healing, behind His power, behind His authority, behind all the energies He demonstrated, was the love of God. That was Christ. What Christ came to personify. And what are we? Romans 8 says, we have been called and predestined to be conformed to His image. A Christ is the head, we are the body. A Christ is the bridegroom, we are His bride. So what do we reflect? We reflect Christ. And what did Christ reflect? The love of God. So, what do we reflect? The love of God. If A equals B, B equals C, C equals A. Christ reveal God's love. We reveal Christ. So understand what our main purpose is on earth. To reveal God's love. Thank God for all the revelations. Thank God for all the powers. But remember, all powers flow from His compassion. He healed because He has compassion on the sick. He resurrect because He has compassion. Look at every healing that Christ did. Behind it is His love. Sometimes He sent to some people. Sometimes the people came to Him. Behind it is all the love of God. Why did he heal while in the wilderness when they came to him? When he said, come, let us go aside to rest. And the multitudes followed him. And he says, he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he healed them. When the leper came to him in Mark chapter 1, he says, if you are willing, uh, heal me. Jesus was able, Jesus was willing. He says, I will be thou cleansed. His love was first, then his healing. So remember what we are called to be on the earth. We are called to be the very expression of God's love. In this revival that God is bringing us into, it is not an ordinary revival of love. It is a revival of the love of God. Inside this revival, people will get caught up. There will be many people caught up with the signs and wonders. They will be amazed. People will be caught up by the demonstrations of power. We will be transported. In fact, when all the 10,000 churches are established, in fact, when all the 10 churches are established, uh, in the midst of preaching, when we finish, I'll be transported from one place to another. People will be caught up with these signs and wonders. I remember behind it all, 
we have been called for one purpose and one purpose alone. All the others are subsidiaries from that purpose. They are incidental to that purpose. To express the love of God. Why do you think Jesus left with us only one commandment? Correct? He only left one commandment. He didn't leave ten commandments. He left one commandment. Moses left ten commandments. And uh, the Pharisees came and left thousands of commandments. Traditional church come and went and left several hundred more. Jesus came only left one. Because that was the only commandment that he wants us to be. And I can use these words. Jesus was a personification of love. That means everything about him, his thoughts, his actions, his words, love was flowing. Love thinker no evil. So love affects the thoughts. His thoughts were flowing with love. His words were flowing with love. His actions were flowing with love. And we can use these words of ourselves today. We are called to be the personification of love. We are His bride. We are His body. We are called to be His personification of love. Let everything in your life be measured based on that personification and expression of the greatest commandment, which is love. So here we are in the book of Ephesians. We are called before the foundation of the earth. It says even in verse 4, we are chosen to be holy without blame before Him in love. And that continues the story of what uh, He has come to make known. Then it says in verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He make us accepted in the Beloved. So we were in Christ. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins and everything that is there. Now very interestingly, uh, if you look over at the book of Revelation chapter 5, in the song that they sang of the Lamb of God, Remember it was eight, the four living creatures, the twenty-four elders, each have a harp, golden bowls for incense, which are praise of saints, and they all sang a song. So heaven was worshipping. And they said, who were saying? All the hosts of heaven, including the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders. And they sang, You are worthy to take a scroll to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests of our God, and we shall reign on earth. Now it says, You are worthy to take a scroll to open his seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us. Can you imagine the four living creatures saying, You have redeemed us? Can you imagine the 24 elders saying, You have redeemed us? Now we know that the 24 elders and the 4 living creatures are not humans. They are singing the same song. What was happening? Well, during the satanic rebellion, one sin come into the universe through Lucifer who fell and became Satan and polluted and took one third of the fallen angels away. Everything was affected by sin. Everything. Sin changed everything. The knowledge of sin changed everything. Knowledge of the rebellion changed everything. Even though there was a pristine side, a boundary side, and a war, uh, warfare side that was designated, sin changed everything. Until Jesus came. See, Jesus brought a new knowledge of how sin is neutralized, absorbed, and rendered powerless. 
So something changed of the revelation of God when sin came. But with Christ coming, when Christ rose from the dead by the glory of the Father, Christ got back the glow and another aspect of the glory into heaven. So that heaven is affected from the very throne room of God to the furthest reaches of the universe. The pristine universe was touched. Even though it had never fallen, it was touched by the revelation of Christ. The boundary zone was touched by the glorification and revelation of Christ. The warfare section, of course, crying, all this rebellion, suddenly was touched by the victory and the revelation of Christ. So Christ came into every atom and molecule spiritual and natural of the universe. Every atom that was revealed from the manifestation of the throne room of God, from the hypostasis of God to the whole created universe. That was what Christ did. The redemption of His forgiveness and so for the first time, the universe saw the love of God. They saw the love of God. They never seen this love before. They knew that the Father loved them through creation. But for the Father and the Son to reveal themselves in Giving himself to take creation back. Oh, such love has never been seen. Which is why one of the composers of the song, the one that we sang just now to God be the glory. It's the first time, first intro part that tells how that uh, even the voices of a million angels could not express our gratitude or what God has done. I'd like to add to that. Even the voices of all creation cannot express our gratitude to the revelation of Christ. That's why God proclaimed Philippians 2, 4. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 Let every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus represents the God who came into His creation, cleansed it, and brought His creation back up. Something that has never been done. Now, in that revelation, God has wanted to also reveal a group of people who can take this love of His and spread it across the universe. And He did not plan it only in our time. Way before the foundation of the earth. Now, there was a God dimension beyond that, I say in this series. By the very beginning, there was something hiding. Hidden way back in the ages from all other ages. Ephesians says it in this manner in chapter 3 again. Ephesians says in verse 5, chapter 3, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, it was hidden. And in uh, chapter 2, verse 4, A God who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, when we were dead in trespasses, make us alive together with Christ, by grace we have been saved, raise us up together and make us sit together in the heavenlies in Christ. 
So when He seats us in the heavenlies, is to reveal His love. Jesus seated at the right hand of God was a new revelation of the love of God that God has in mind. Jesus in His love. So there was the revelation of God's love before the foundation of the world. There is the revelation of God's love in Jesus' redemption for us at the cross. And there is the revelation of God's love in chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, inside us. Do you notice the different levels of revelation? There is the width, the length, the depth, the height. Look at the different levels. One was before the foundation of the earth. Then there was that revelation at the cross and resurrection. Then there's this revelation of love inside us. It was 14, 15. For this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that He will grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. The Christ who is the personification of the love of God. Christ who is a hypostasis, the substance of God. Who reveal in an image, who reveal in a flesh, who rose up from the dead, who seated in the heavenly places. That Christ wants to come personally into each one of our life and reveal a measure of love that we never had before. Already when we were born again, he, uh, Romans 5 verse 3 to 8 tells us the love of God is shared abroad in our heart. When in verse 1, we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God, etc., etc. To verse eight, uh, 5 to 8, the, peace, the love of God is shared abroad in our heart. So we had the love of God shed abroad in our heart. But there's more. That was when we were born again. Notice that this verse was written to a church mature and strong in the Lord. These are the efficient Christians. They are a mega city church. They had been three years under the teaching of Paul. And Paul might have visited them a few other times after that. They are a mighty strong church that was so powerful it affected all of Asia Minor. They are a church that had all the fivefold ministries grown inside them. Yet Paul, in writing Ephesians, was telling them about another level, another measure. He was not praying for, for young Christians. This Ephesians 3 prayer is not a prayer for young Christians. It's not even a prayer to accept Christ. It is a prayer it's almost like a prayer for a pastor. If you treat the efficient church as a church where all of them are fully grown, it's like a prayer for a, a, an elder, a, 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 someone who has walked with God for 10 or 20 or 30 years. And you thought you know all of God? He prayed for them that Christ will dwell inside them and that they will be rooted and grounded in. We all know what roots do. When a tree is firmly rooted down and grounded, tornadoes may come, the tree will remain. When you have a freak storm, sometimes you have trees that are blown down. Those are the trees where the root power cannot fight the storm power. So when the thunderstorms and the strong winds and the hurricanes and all those things come, it depends on how strong the roots are. The stronger the roots, the more you can withstand. Now if our roots are roots of love, you know what it means? <laughs> what are the thunderstorms? What are the hurricanes, the typhoons? They are anything that stop you from loving. They are the challenges to your love. 
So when the typhoons, the hurricanes, the storm that causes you to say, don't love so much, don't forgive, don't love, don't love, don't, 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 don't love, don't forgive, you know, do all the things opposite from love. But your roots say, love, love, love. I will not give up love. And then when your roots give up, when the love in your life cannot equal the storm outside your life, you fall down and topple. Because you don't have roots and you're not grounded. It's not a normal grounding. There are other places in the Bible that talk about rooted and grounded and being the foundation of God's word. Right? We will teach that. That's separate. In the context of Ephesians 3, it was talking about rooted and grounded in the love of God. Which means that will your love run dry? If your love runs dry, it means that that's your limit. And Paul was talking about how they are rooted and grounded in such a way in Christ, and if Christ is your foundation of love, you will only stop loving when Christ stops loving. And since Christ doesn't stop loving, you don't stop loving. And thus, you can restore the storm. Storms may come, the floods may come, but the roots are so strong, you remain walking in the love of God. So there is another level of the revelation of God's love. This is the way in which God in this revival wants to make us the personification of His love. Until you are the very substance of His love. So that when God speaks to any creature in the universe, and God says, you want to know what my love is like? He can say, look at Christ. But now He's going to say, you want to know what my love is like? Look at my bride. Look at my church. Can God say that right now on the planet? No. Because, 90% in the church does not walk in love. We walk in doctrine. We walk in different programs. We walk in different aims and goals. But have you seen any church with their goal and objective? Every church has their goal and objective. Every ministry has their goal and all objective. Have you seen any one of them put number one in their object objective? To love like Christ loved. Have you seen it in any bulletin, any objective, or any goal, or any vision, or any church? But we replace that with a lot of other things. We prioritize everything else except what God prioritized. Don't forget, discovering our destiny and what God made us to be is discovering everything. There is such a thing as majors and minor. The major thing that God has created us to be is to express and be the hypostasis of His love. Don't you ever forget that in your life. When you begin to see that, then you see that every challenge is in life is a challenge to love. If you could succeed in loving, loving God and loving people, even though in the eyes of the world you seem to lose, you have won. You have enough promises in the Bible that encourage you in that direction. The promises of the Bible, like Romans 8.28, that says, If you love God, all things work together for good to those who love God. So, it tells us that if your love for God is unflinching, unwavering, and immovable, the universe is on your side. Even if a hundred thousand soldiers are against you, even if your community is against you, even if your persecutors are against you, even if an entire country is against you, even if the world is against you, 
Romans 8, 28 says, the universe is on your side. And then to encourage us to love, Deuteronomy 28 says, if you keep all these commandments, you will be the head and not the tail. Now, what law will keep all commandments? The law of love. The law of love. When you walk in love with God and you walk in love with your neighbor, the universe wants to make you the head. When you do not walk in love and you do not walk as God commands, the universe is against you and wants to make you the tail. That's enough encouragement from the word to walk in love. God is saying, the universe is against you if you don't walk in love. At some point, now in this planet that is fallen, in our fallen society that hasn't come back to God yet, where there are many criminals and people out there who don't walk with God and where evil is going to increase when the Antichrist comes. There are a lot of evil that seem to get away with it. Bad people seem to get away with it. And good people who do bad things seem to get away with it. And uh, all these things, but remember this. No one gets away. There is a God on the throne. And there is a universe. And God rules. And God says, if you want to have the universe on your side, and God on your side, walk in love. If you want to have the universe working against you, then you don't walk in love. The universe wants to make you the head. And really that tells us something. Authority comes from love. You think God will entrust you with authority whether on this earth or in the next age to come, if you don't walk in love, you will abuse the authority, misuse the authority, and become another devil. And you see how important love is. So we see here that God wants to reveal the weave, the length, the breadth of God's love. And you thought that was all. I need to bring across this point very strong that the glorious church is the church of love. You know where the title glorious church is found? Ephesians 5. That's where the title glorious church comes from. In Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about the relationship between husbands and wives. And then he said in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, so the word is still present. That he might present her to himself a glorious church. Can you see the word glorious church? Glorious church is in the context of love between husband and wife. What does that tell you? There is a church that is glorious because of love. Most beautiful relationship will be between husbands and wives who really love each other. And it tells us, Paul tells us, that he's not talking about human husbands and wives in verse 32. This is a great mystery. I speak concerning Christ and the church. So while he talked about the natural, he talked about the, something else, a revelation that he had. And he says that he might present her to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and be not blemish. Now notice the word, holy and without blemish. And compare that with Ephesians chapter 1, 
way back before the foundation of the earth. But it says here in verse 4, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. And that word is unblemished. Same Greek word as unblemished. So here He chose us before the foundation of the earth. And then He showed us His love on the cross. And then He inputs His love inside us through our inner, inner man in Ephesians 3. And then at the conclusion, He brings us in Ephesians chapter 5 and talk about the mysterious relationship between soulmates, husband and wife, who love each other so that they express the very love of God. That, he says here, then only the church reach a point of without blemish, without spot. What I'm saying here is every time tied back to God's love. And in conclusion, when you look at Ephesians 5, you can make this statement. If the church didn't have the word and didn't have love, it cannot be without spot and blemish. Love is an important factor inside this whole process. So in the glorious church, God wants to establish His love. The number one important thing in the Christian life, above all else, is to become the substance of love. I don't want to use all those complicated Greek words. But in a way, you like Greek? The hypostasis of love. The substance of God's love. So that your very saliva, every drop is God's love. Your sweat is God's love. Your thoughts are God's love. Your words are God's love. Your actions are God's love. We are the hypostasis. Everything in you that can be a molecule that can touch and feel is God's love. That's what God calls us to be. That is number one above all other numbers. And for that to happen, we bring you back to the chart again. That we have. And let's have the chart up again. And let's have the one with the pie. Every mathematical equation in the Human life represents something. I haven't finished all of them. The last week I talked about the Trinity, the equations of God, and uh, then we haven't got to calculus, the integral calculus. That one represents free will and predestination. See, free will and predestination is found in the integral calculations, where. The moon revolves around the earth. Now for the moon to revolve around the earth, let me illustrate to a certain extent before we go to this, just out of interest. Let me take a small rock and a smaller sized rock. So you have uh, this rock, have a smaller rock, and the moon revolves around the earth or the earth revolves around the sun, whichever one you want. It is not really circular, but it's uh, elliptical. But let's, for the time being, see it as a circle. And uh, so, as it revolves, there are two forces that make something go around the other. The force of gravity is pulling the moon to the earth. If the moon were not moving, the moon would fall into the earth by the force of gravity. Just like men send up satellites and when the satellite run out of motion or energy, the satellites fall down to the earth. In fact, all satellites that are sent up there have a use by day. Because their orbits go lower and lower and lower until it's too low and the force of gravity is greater than their force of escaping from gravity so they drop down to the earth. So they have a use by day. All satellites. Because as they go around, their energy decreases. 
the same way the earth goes round the sun. Right? Scientists will tell you after how many, how many, how many billions of years, the earth will, of course, fall into the sun, if not for the sun exploding the supernova first. Either way. Now, for the moon to remain constantly around the earth, you need two forces. The force of gravity is pulling the moon to the earth. But that is what we call uh, centripetal force, pulling it downwards. But the moon has motion. There's a movement away from the earth. If the force of gravity on the earth was suddenly to stop, the moon will go in a straight line in a tangent. The tangent starts from the very spot where the gravity forces are stopped. And then the moon. if the, the earth stop pulling the moon, at the very spot the tangent will be formed, pew, it will go in a straight line. That is a central fugal force. That is throwing something out. And uh, you see dancers and skaters, they, they use, make use of those forces that uh, you see them when they dance and then uh, they will do a twirl which I cannot do at the moment <laughs> and uh, when, they, they, when they do a twirl their hands are extended outside, right? so their hands are extended outside and they twirl then when they pull their hands inward because of mass and then everything is compressed together something has to change that is, the speed goes faster. So when they pull themselves in, it goes fast. Then when they will slow down, they spread themselves out. Because the mass is spread out and all the energy forces. So we realize that centrifugal force, when you turn something, doesn't the thing want to come up? The thing wants to escape when you're churning something. So centrifugal force is throwing things out. So you have the centrifugal force trying to throw it out, centripetal force trying to pull it in. And so for the moon to go around the earth, you have the centripetal force pulling it down, centrifugal force pulling it away at 90 degrees. And at the exact 90 degrees, the proportion, it goes down. And you keep going down because two forces are at work. Two forces are at work. The central fugal force wants to throw it out. That represents your free will. Your free will wants to go your own way. The central petal force, which is the force of gravity, pulls you back to earth. That's the predestination force that draws you in. Predestination alone is not enough. You will crash onto the moon. Free will alone is not enough. You will fly into some empty space. But an equal force of free will and predestination keeps you in orbit around the Lord. So in mathematics we say, let the centrifugal force be F, stand for free will. Let the centripetal force be P for predestination. So you have df over dp. That's your in integral calculus. Right? You have a d dx over dy. Remember all your dx over dy. dx represents df. dy represents dp, which is predestination. So integral cal calculations, integral calculations represent, of course, the area of uh, predestination and free will. That will be another sermon that we will be teaching at some time when we touch on predestination. For now, let's go to simple pie. <laughs> okay, simple pie. So, <laughs> okay, simple pie. Pi to 30 places. 10 places? 3.1415. 9 to 6, 5, 3, 5, 10 places. Second, 10 places. 5 to 11 to 20th place. 5, 6, 7, 8. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, 5 
Uh, there is a 897-3223 and uh, at the end one is a 849. So 20 places. Then you have the other one which is uh, 246 and then 33832 uh, and with 849. 5 to 30 places. Now, so phi is a simple, simple measurement of a diameter, uh, a relationship between the diameter and the circumference. So here's the diameter here. It takes 3.14159265353. That's the 10 places. It takes this, three of this, one, two, three, plus a little bit more to form this circle in terms of the length. That's pi. So pi is the relationship between the circumference and the diameter. God is a trinity. Pi is found in everything. And uh, God is a trinity. So when the trinity wants to come to our plane, which is the diameter, we are living on this line. The relationship is what I call is, uh, irrational number of pi. 3.14159265355. And so that relationship is the trinity coming into our realm. It's an irrational number. Today they'll calculate pi to a trillion numbers. One trillion with the supercomputers. And the numbers have never repeated itself. Never. You know some numbers like uh, if you divide uh, 100 uh, by, uh, if you divide 10 by 3, you have three, 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 continuously. But uh, you don't have, 10 divided by 3 is 3 point three, 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 continue, same number. But pi doesn't repeat. The more you calculate, the more it differentiate. Because as I said, the reason it cannot repeat is because this is the what I call most beautiful presentation of pi as a formula. That pi is pi squared over 6 actually equal to 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared plus 1 over 4 squared plus 1 over 5 squared and you continue and continue. Can you see that it will all keep on increasing? The numbers will keep on changing. It is infinite series. As many numbers as you can think of, that will be 1 plus, so in the end it's 1 plus uh, n squared right to the ending, if there's an ending and you can only stop when you want to stop counting so it's never stopped so this is like God creating when God creates, there's an expansion and when God reveals himself into our realm the equation of pi comes from and so we talk about how uh, Remember, pi squared over 6 equals 1, 1 plus 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared. Remember this formula, easy to remember, right? This formula, easy to remember. Okay. Maybe the formula for pi, hard to remember. Uh, most of you stops at 4 number, 1.14, <laughs> you know, 141415. And uh, so, but this continues on, pi squared over 6. Now we bring the other picture. Uh, the second one. Here is your spirit man, your spirit will, spirit emotion, spirit mind, and your soul will, soul mind, soul emotion. And Watchman's book, he calls this uh, one is uh, the conscience, the intuition, and then uh, the uh, communion. So he calls that different thing. But totally this is your spirit and this is your soul. That makes six parts. Three parts of your spirit, three parts of your soul. And this consists of your heart. Watch, uh, Kenneth Hagin tells you in his book that the spirit equals the heart. So to him, the heart is the spirit. So he's telling you the spirit is just this part. Watch, many tells you that your heart is actually your soul plus your conscience. Three parts of your soul and one part of your spirit. That is in his book, Spiritual Man, book one. Uh, Spiritual Man. And 
Both are right, but both are also wrong. Because the heart consists of your spirit and your soul together. So when you add Kenneth Hagin and Watchmen Knee together, you realize that in total, this is the heart. That is why sometimes when the word heart is used, when you say the heart is evil, it's because the soul, out of these six, these six are fighting for preeminence. It's like six people come together, one want to be the Red Indian Chief. There can only be one Red Indian Chief. So if the Red Indian Chief is the soul, or the emotion of the soul, then out of the heart proceeded all manner of evil. The heart is the center of gravity. The, the center of gravity is who the Red Indian Chief is. Uh, if the Red Indian Chief, uh, pardon me if you're Red Indian. <laughs> I'm, uh, so, the Red Indian Chief is any part of the spirit that is fine. But not quite so fine. You know why? Because even if the Red Indian Chief comes from the spirit, you might be strong in the spirit in one area but not in another. That is, if your spirit emotion is strong, you can sense things. But your spirit mind is not strong, you cannot interpret things. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 talk about how the, the mind of the spirit is different from the mind of the carnal mind. The, the carnal mind cannot receive anything from the spirit. But the spiritual mind deals with spiritual things. I saw you have a situation like Acts chapter 21, where the disciples... When they met Paul, and Paul was on his way to Jerusalem, the Bible says in Acts 21, they told Paul through the Spirit not to go to Jerusalem. They said through the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. So the disciples were strong enough to pick up some emotional thing. They pick up that Paul was going to go through danger. They pick up that Paul was going to be imprisoned. But they interpret what they pick up wrongly. They Paul told not, not to go. They Paul told. They Paul told. <laughs> they told Paul not to go. <laughs> yes. They Paul told. So Paul was told. They told Paul not to go. And they interpret wrongly. Paul says, God told him to go. He confirmed that God wants him to go. Because they instead of interpreting their spiritual mind, they interpret with their soul mind. Whenever you sense someone is in danger, or someone is um, uh, about to be in prison, your natural mind says, danger, don't go. That's the soul mind. But the funny thing about the spirit is the spirit sometimes sends you to danger zones. And that could be God's will. If you walk long enough, we've got to know that the straight and narrow way is the right way. The broad way is the wrong way. And so sometimes the way of the Lord is through the valley of the shadow of death. But as you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, even when you're in Psalm 23, there's still the valley, valley of the shadow of death. When you're walking through that, it is a valley of the shadow of death. You would have the shadow of death there. It will be dimly lit. It will be danger zone there. But if it's God's will for you to go through, you go through. Was it God's will for Jesus Christ to die on the cross? Of course. Not easy, not pleasant. Was it God's will for Jesus to be uh, arrested? Yes. And he knew that was happening under the fullness of time. He told his disciples in Matthew 16, he says, The Son of Man must be betrayed and crucified. That was the path God wanted to walk. It was God's perfect will for him. When Jesus came to this planet, you know what this planet looked like? Dark and dreary in the spiritual world. But it was God's perfect will for him to come. So sometimes, the way of God is different. I've seen in the vision, sometimes visions are allegorical. I've seen in visions, uh, sometimes like Christians walking along a path. 
And then there's another path that is difficult and looks dimly lit, and it looks like they're going to pay a price. Everybody don't go to the hard one, they go to the easy one. But then the next vision they cross is show the end of the other side. On, the, on one side is actually more danger than the side that is narrow. But looks can be deceiving. Remember Pilgrim's Progress. If you remember the story of Pilgrim's Progress, there are many roads. But the road that the pilgrim was supposed to take had to go through a very narrow place where you got to lose everything. So a lot of them, Mr. Willie Wise and all the others, don't want to walk with him. Because they say, we want to remain here, we don't want to go that road. And when he go through the road, it cost him everything. But when he got through, wow, everything was better. But all the other followers or companions on the road didn't want to go through. So much is the mysteries of God. So sometimes, even if one third of your spirit is the red Indian chief, then you still need balancing. You can pick up something but cannot interpret. That's also not so good. Uh, all six form the heart. Now, one of the six but I'm not ruling the others. And it's important to have, for example, in this area, spirit, will, spirit, emotion, spirit, mind. That just like even in the natural here, okay, let's look at the soul. No, look at the spirit yet, look at the soul. Spirit, will, spirit, mind, spirit, emotion. They look like equal parts in a circle, but they're not exactly equal. You cannot run your life based on emotions. Neither can you run your life based on your mind alone. In the end, your will that chooses. But the will says how to choose. This one telling me something, this one telling me something. So you ask a lot to show you. So sometimes your will chooses against your mind or against your emotions. Your emotion and your mind were just in your conference table as part of your advices. But your will has to choose. Your will has to choose. This is the path that you take. When you get married, emotions are involved, correct? Mind is involved. You discuss your plans. Uh, when you're going to have children, when you're going to marry, you know, what days you're going to get married, and then uh, how to get to know each other, see whether all, all those things, a lot of things are involved. But in the end, the will still chooses. At the uh, wedding, they don't ask you, do you feel like having so and so? No, no, they just, you know, uh, do you take so and so? Then your answer is not, I feel. Your answer is neither, I think. Because everyone tells you, when you go into a marriage, you don't know what is after that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no. it's what I call, what, what, in, what, what they will call, you know, uh, uh, the best guess. <laughs> the best that they know how. Because you don't really know everything about a person. You know as much as you can. But you don't really know. You still take a risk. There's a risk in everything. Still take a risk. And your answer is, I will. I will. Now, now that we understand the soul, this is easier. Spirit, mind, and will. The spirit is the natural leader to be there. The spirit must choose. Now, for the will of the spirit to choose, that's where you need the word. Because sometimes you don't understand the word, but you know the word is still right. So you still choose the word. Sometimes you don't feel anything about the word, but you believe the word. The word is still true. Like some of you, when you were praying in tongues, or when you got the baptism in the Spirit, or when you were born again, you know the whole story of Jesus. You might not understand everything, but you pray the prayer and you say, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. 
your will makes a decision. Your mind half understand. Your emotions sometimes is there, sometimes not there. But your will chooses. In the baptism in the spirit, when you were speaking in tongues, some of you have dramatic experience. But some others are like mine, where the language is there, you don't understand. Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 and 15, my mind doesn't understand. And you thought that you're speaking gibberish. You thought you're making your own words. You thought you're making your own sound. So, your mind, your mind here doesn't understand. But they say, Paul didn't say, I feel or I think. Paul says, I will pray with my spirit. I will pray with my understanding. The will is supposed to be the natural leader. Right, so, in that sense, we settled the question in terms of uh, who is to be the natural leader inside us. Uh, what happens is, all of your spirit must be involved. All of your soul is involved, and these are the parts that establish the heart. Now, with this picture, Romans, uh, Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10 become clearer. Just keep this picture for a while. Look at Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10. Hebrews 8. And uh, talking about New Covenant. In Hebrews 8, looking at uh, what's that? For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I'll put my laws in their mind and write them in the heart. So how does God put his laws inside us? Into your spirit. His laws enter your spirit. But he's still writing it on your heart because your soul is part of your heart. Can you see that? He's still writing upon your heart. Then you move over to Hebrews chapter 10. And in Hebrews chapter 10, it says here, verse 16. This is a covenant that I make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. So, he was right. He put the laws here in the spirit because when God first come, He come into our spirit. So we know the putting part has to be spirit. Put on Christ. Christ comes in. So the spirit writes it upon the mind. And the mind is a dianoia mind. And then now in Hebrews 10, I will put my laws into their heart. So he's still putting, his, now that he's writing it, now he can put more, he can begin to work here, here, or here. So he can keep putting and writing, and then he says, I will write them, and in their minds I will write them. So he's still writing, completing it here. And here the writing comes up all the way to the body, the mind, the body the mind or the body. It comes further up. Another teaching we can go into deeper. But in the meantime, let's go back to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Talk about the glorious church. This is the subject that we are talking about. In uh, Ephesians chapter 5, it says that Verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. Now the glorious church is talking about the glory of God coming to fill your spirit and all your soul under your body is also filled because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, Corinthians tells us that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about our body, we are being built up as a temple. So our body is the temple. And God dwells in our spirit and in our 
So that is where remember the equation pi squared divided by 6 equals the endless numbers that is there. 1 over n squared continuously. I. These are the six parts. Pi represents the dimensional shift where the circumference is in ratio to the diameter. Pi squared is God revealing himself again in a new dimension. He's already revealed himself in his creation. Jesus was like a fresh revelation of God. And now that Jesus has revealed himself, we suddenly begin to see that the love of God needs to flood all this part. It's shed in our heart, but it must fill us to the fullness. To be the glorious church, it is actually the kingdom of God has come. Ephesians chapter 1, the fullness of God. Chapter 2, the habitation of God. Chapter 3, again the fullness of God. It all has to do with the fullness of God. God in us. We cannot love with our own love. Only the love of God and the love of Christ can transform us. And the more Christ dwells in us, since Christ is a personification of love, the more of Christ in us, the more we are actually the personification of Christ. And it has to actually do with, remember when it says the glorious church without spot or wrinkle. I could have added Ephesians 4 also, you wonder why I skipped that one out. Ephesians 4 is the perfect church. We reach the fullness of the stature of Christ. Again, it talks about the glorious church. Talk about the kingdom of God coming on the earth. I can say that the glorious church is filled with the glory of God. Correct. That would be simple English. What the glorious church is church of glory. That's why we always have the title of glory at the end, cathedral of glory. Long ago we started a church, Tabernacle of Glory. Glorious church. But the glorious church, another phrase for it, is the transfigured church. The church that is transfigured. While Christ was only transfigured on a mountain as a type, in this revival, it's a permanent transfiguration. What do you think? Isaiah 60 is for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now, in moving to that area, remember Christ in us, the hope of glory, that is found in the book of Colossians. So if you want to look at the book of Colossians, Ephesians and Philippians, and then Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, as he talks about Christ, he made sure the invisible God, and then he comes into our life. Talk about mystery here in verse 26. And again, remember, this mystery is hidden from the ages. Now you know he's talking about the same thing. This mystery. And remember, the love of God is the life of God, is the light of God. They are the three same things. The light of God is His glory. The more love, the more light. Because they are the same thing. The more life, the more light. So the light is what the glory is. So light, life and love are three parts of the same thing. Or three different views of the same substance. So here is the mystery from the ages again. It was 26. Colossians 1, 26. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations but now has been revealed to his saints, to him, to them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ 
in you the hope of glory. Now we know that in his time is the hope of glory. Because Romans chapter 8 tells us that he's still hope. But he's saying that the creation is waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. Waiting for this glory to come out. When will this glory come out? Us, the glorious church. It is end time. Now is the time we look at Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. The Transfiguration. Now, before Matthew 17 is the previous chapter, 16, verse 28. So, we bear that to read up. In verse 28, it says here, of Matthew 16, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. So, he's talking about the kingdom. Now, chapter 17, verse 1. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then when Peter tried to say something, it was fine. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I well please. Hear him. And they were all frightened. That's the transfiguration of Jesus. Cross reference to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 27 to 28. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now it came to pass about eight days later. So you know what was happening? Jesus repeated himself. So eight days before he told them, some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Seven days. He also tells them that some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Sixth day, that some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom of God. So slight differences, he repeated himself. So we compare the verses, they don't contradict. What's happening, if you look at the Gospels, they're actually two different places, all moving along. And Jesus was repeating himself, telling them over several days. And so this was eight days before. And it says in verse 28, came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went out on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. Behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his disease, and which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So this was, again, they will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. When Jesus first started his ministry at the age of 30, he says, Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. At hand. And then he demonstrates things about the kingdom of God. Now is the end of days. To God in heaven is like two days. To us is like 2,000 years. It's only two days. We're coming to the beginning of the third day. And the third day is a millennium. We're just in between the second and the third day. And in heaven, remember, 1,000 years is like one day. The next 50, 50, uh, 1,000 1, uh, years is like one day, 24 hours. And uh, 50 years 
is only 5 out of 100 will be 1 out of uh, 20. It's 1 twentieth of a day, which means it will be slightly 1 hour plus. So the next 50 years to God is only another hour plus in between the two days. And in these next seven cycles of seven years, the kingdom of God is manifest. That's a privilege. The glorious church is actually the transfiguration of the church. The kingdom of God has come. Christ, the hope of glory, rise up within us. So I conclude with this uh, interesting vision that one of uh, our followers online had come across. And it's appropriate time to share that. See, each of you have different downloads. And Arion has a very interesting download. That was some time back. That is in US. Arion was taken... And some of you, the same thing. I, I saw some of your downloads. You were taken to the Red Sea by Moses. And uh, Aaron was taken to the Red Sea uh, to, to where Moses parted the sea. And he saw Moses lifting up the rod. He saw the two spirit beings. And what he saw uh, was energy flowing up. And how is the energy that pushed back the sea. The side effect, people hear the wind, saw the wind. You read in the book of uh, Exodus, you see the wind, but it doesn't record the invisible spiritual sign. Then after that, and Moses was the one who took him there. And Moses was teaching him about part of the Red Sea. He says, obey the word. That's what God said, you just obey. Because the anointing is in your hand. In this first part of the move where God is giving you vision and revelations, establish, telling you who you are, establish an order in your life. Remember, when you walk in love, you don't use the anointing for yourself to turn stones into bread. You never use the anointing for yourself. You don't use it for money. You don't use it for fame. You don't use it for flesh. You don't misuse your authority and your power. Remember Jesus was hungry a few times and he never used his power. He will never use his power for himself. He will only use his power for others because that is love. Love does not think of yourself. Love thinks for others. And so the glorious church will be the personification of love and you will have such power and authority but you will not use your power and authority for yourself. You will use it in love. You use it in the compassion of God. And out of that flows the power of God. Exactly like Jesus did. So in the same way that God says, once the anointing is upon your life, you remember that everyone who come to Jesus was healed. But remember Jesus didn't go out and heal everyone. At one point, he went to the pool of Siloam. Everybody was sick there, waiting for the angel to disturb the water, to jump in. He only went there and he won. Because the father only told him what to do. Even though he has all the power and all the love and he feels for everyone, I'm sure he felt far for every sick one there who is suffering. He is still bound to only obey the father. He said, the son will do nothing except what the father showed him. Remember they challenged him at the cross, when he was hanging on the cross? Come down, if you are the son of God that you claim you are. Could he have come down? Yes! Why didn't he come down? Because he put himself there. It was not the nails that kept him coming. It was his free wheel. So he never misused his authority. He never misused his power because he was a personification of love. Now you understand why God has to drill love into us. 
because for 2,000 years in our time, two days ago, we have seen enough abuse of authority and power. We saw about 1,000 years ago what the church can become when it becomes economically strong and politically strong. How corrupt it was. We see in our lifetime how when preachers become famous, they start preaching wrong doctrine. They start preaching their bad doctrine. They start advocating wrong methodologies. We see in our time how authority is abused. Finances are misused. And spiritual visions are used to one's own end. The problem, a lack of love and a lack of holiness. But primarily a lack of love for God and a love for people. As a, as a result, preachers see the sheep, not as sheep alone, see the sheep as lamb chops. Yeah. Only to be sheared only to be chopped, only to be barbecued. <laughs> Lack of love. What is true love? John 3.16 is the expression of God's love. First John 3.16 is the expression of true love. And Paul demonstrated that. He said there is no love greater than when one is willing to die for another person. You ask any preacher, ask the famous one today. Are you willing to die for the church? No. Persecution comes, they'll be the first on the jack plane out to another place where they find mentions. <coughs> to give themselves. To give of their times, their talent, and their resources for the use of God. By all means, God bless you. Enjoy what God gives you. But remember, money is measured, the value of money is measured on how you use it to help others, not how you help yourselves. What is the value of a life? Okay, how valuable is your life? In heaven, your life is only as valuable as is of value to somebody else. Not to yourselves. The true value of a life is how much your life can help other lives. So if your life is only helping yourself and your doctrine is love thyself, full stop. And everything you do in this life is love thyself. And the whole world is built around love thyself. You've got a lot of accumulation for thyself. You're one of those in the Bible who say eat, drink and be merry. Build bigger barns. All for thyself. On this earth, you might have some worth in value or hard dollars and assets. But in heaven, your worth is zero. Your worth is only what is worth to another person. That's how God values your life. A self-existing life for its own self-existence is zero. If your life can give meaning to a million other lives, then your life has a million dollars worth. Um, a, a millionaire life. Let's not measure it by money. If your life can help ten lives, your life is worth ten in terms of the value. So how much can your life? Now it doesn't mean that you have to physically talk to those people. Because today, some of us are impacted by lies that have lived long ago where we never met them face to face. They left their books, their writing, their work, even Paul's writings. I'll pay us. Can you imagine how much reward Paul is having up there now? His life is still affecting our lives. So what is your life worth? Your life can be built in such a way it continues to be a blessing to others. And so for God to entrust us with an authority equal to Jesus so that He can do John 14 verse 12, the works of Jesus and greater works of Jesus, He must first invest His love in us. Train us in His love. Train us to understand His love. Train us to understand the value of love so that you won't use miracles to just promote your own ministry. 
You won't do things to self-promote yourself. In fact, if God used you greatly, you should more not talk about yourself. You should more remind people that it's Jesus. Because then you have a greater platform to say it is really Jesus. That is why God said invest His love in our lives to establish us before He releases signs and wonders and authority. <coughs> so as we look at the glorious church and what God wants to invest in, when God has invested all His authority, one word from Him, and you do it. Like lifting up the rod of Moses. Everything is the obedience of God. So after that, God took, uh, Moses took Arion to the transfiguration. Yeah, tying him back to here. And then Jesus came. Jesus showed Jesus. Jesus can be wondered. Every story of Jesus, Jesus himself teach. That's the wonderful thing about our Lord Jesus. He's so humble. He's so humble. And so Jesus showed Arion transfiguration and show how he was transfigured as he prayed the one in Luke chapter 9 then Aaron was told by Jesus hey, look at how I'm transfigured and then Jesus said look at what I was praying and then he heard the heart of Jesus pray what did Jesus pray? There, Luke chapter 9. Uh, okay. Luke chapter 9. And it says there in verse 29. As he prayed. Wouldn't you want to know what he prayed? What did he say? What did he pray? For additional tips. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you all want to know what he prayed. Jesus was just praying and meditating on the love of the Father. That was the revelation he gave to Ariel. And Jesus himself said, See this time, the Bible school that Jesus got is very nice, isn't it? He's taking some of you back to the Bible times, and all you're going to experience it. This 40-day fast is marvelous. Amen. And sometimes the angels will take you, sometimes the saints will take you. Wouldn't it be nice Jesus can tell you, this is what I pray? Because the Bible record, but he didn't tell you what. And it will, whatever the answer will be in line with the Bible. And then Moses taking you back and saying, hey, look at what I'm doing here. Hey, let me tell you what I was thinking and doing. Oh, isn't that nice? This is a live Bible school going on. All your privilege. And Jesus said, He was praying and focusing on the love of the Father. And Jesus made this statement, I was not praying to be transfigured. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Because some of us say transfigured. Transfigure me, Lord. Transfigure me, Lord. I mean, look. You know, Transfigure me, Lord. No. He was not even praying about transfiguration. The transfiguration was incidental. Side effect. He was focused on the farm. Now, without turning, I just want to quote this part. Remember Moses in Exodus? He said, Show me your glory. That's Exodus chapter 33. And then, chapter 34, God showed His glory. And then, when Moses saw God's glory, he came down. And when he came down, his face was lighted like a light bulb. But the phrase says, Moses did not know his face was shining. To me, that is quite interesting. Because if any one of us had the glory of God come upon you and your, and your face shine, you'll be, you know, nowadays, you put it on Facebook, Twitter, 
<laughs> social media and say, Look, my face shine! You know, have a selfie! <laughs> you have a lot of selfies to show your, all your shininess. <laughs> Moses didn't even know. How come he didn't know? It was a powerful thing. I mean, when you're coming down, surely the light reflects you. Was wondering where the light came from, and it was actually shining like the sun. So if you came, came, come down at any point where there are shadows, you will see the shadows disappear. When you were daytime, morning, or afternoon, or evening. Of course, if evening would be interesting, everything dark, and then he was a torchlight. <laughs> that would be obvious. But something caught his attention. Something was occupying his mind. The vision of God. Because, and Jesus told Aaron, 2 Corinthians 3.18, the words we've always been preaching, as you behold him, so are you transformed into his glory. So Moses was transformed because he could not forget what God looked like. Even the back parts of the Lord. When he came down, the image was seared and he was, he must have seen it. You know sometimes like you see a bright light and then you close your eyes, you still see it. So he must have been really focused on that light coming down and the glory was there. And then Jesus no area. I was praying and meditating on the love of the Father. He was not even praying for. You think he was praying, you know, when he said, when he prayed, some always think and put words in it, and we thought he said, transfigure me, transfigure me, transfigure me, transfigure me, oh, transfigure me, transfigure me. He was not even asking for transfiguration. He was just focused on the glory of the Father. And then Jesus made this statement to Ariel, which was interesting. He says, Are you surprised that I have to do the same thing like you? Uh, well, we all have 2 Corinthians 3 18, right? Do you know that what he did in uh, Luke chapter 9? He says in verse 29, as he prayed, it's exactly 2 Corinthians 3 18. You were taught what Jesus was special. But Jesus says he was just praying on the love of the Father for him and his love for the Father. In the atmosphere of the love of God. The greatness of the love of the Father and the Father's. He was in union with the love of the Father. And in the union of the love of the Father, the side effects start taking place on the body. When all of the soul got pulled into the gravitational force of God's love, The body was transfigured. Second Corinthians 3 18. So now you know why I emphasize on love so much. Because true glory is true love. The glory of God comes forth from the substance of God's love. You spend your days following the number one predestination. You and I have been chosen before the foundation of the world. Before this planet existed. To be the substance, the hypostasis, the personification. You can catch that. 
Hallelujah. You're part of the glorious church. If you cannot catch that, I'm sorry, you will never see the glory. If you see the side effects of power and everything else, you have not understood the message. Jesus was transfigured while meditating and praying on the love of the Father. In fact, your healing, your miracles, your signs and wonders, forget everything. Just love God and let God love you. Miracles are a side effect. Miracles are miracles only because they defy natural laws. Correct? But in heaven, there are no miracles because everything is a miracle and it's normal. It's only on the, on the earth where we are so self-dependent, so self-reliant, and the world is made up of self-works and the works, whether in team or singular, of all our natural life, that we forgot. The miracles, signs and wonders are the natural habits of heaven. In heaven, whatever you need, appear. It's miraculous. But it's only on the earth. And the key to that is the love of God. So now you know what Jesus prayed. Now you know what Jesus meditated on. Do the same. But I give you one last scripture. Bonus for taking home. <laughs> Back to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Because that will give a clue of what was happening. Because it's not just an intellectual process. So let's go to Ephesians. Chapter 5. Remember I talked about Jesus and the church? And in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I'm speaking of Christ and the church. And I want you to look at what he's talking about. In verse 30, 31, he's actually talking about we are members of his body, of his flesh and bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. Now we all know that the physical pro process of the marriage consummation, of the marriage act, is supposed to be an act of love. Right? Based on all the other background, husbands love your wife, wife loves your husband, everything else comes down to the thing, marriage act is an act of love. Now we know it's been perverted by the world for many, many things. But in its purest form, is an act of love. It was an act of love of two human beings becoming one. That mystery that he's talking about is the mystery of how God's love and our love for God become so entwined that we are in God and God in us. So what Christ did in Luke chapter 9, when he prayed was, he was praying into the love of the Father and praying and allowing the love of the Father to feel him. Under the two are so entwined that the love of the Father was fully in him. And the love of Jesus for the Father, he loved the Father so much. Under their love was entwined in a spiritual way. That there is no other description except the description of the marriage act. The entwining of two flesh. But here is the entwining of two spirits in the love of God. And the glory flow. So how much love must we have? Remember Ephesians 3? Christ in you. Strengthening your inner man. And that your inner man will be rooted and grounded in. Christ entwined in you, you entwined in Christ. You in Him, He in you. That love is so absolute, it changes and transforms you. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we pray.
that you teach us about the glorious church. What it means to be seated in the throne room. And how the throne room can come right into our hearts and our minds. Thank you, Father, for teaching us success in this area. Pray, Father, that you teach us how to be entwined in you. To allow you and your word to be first place in our life. And we to be first place in you. And we will love you so much. We will love you with all of our heart. With all of our soul. With all of our being and strength. Without reservation. And then we will have your love upon us in all its form. Establish that upon our lives so that we can become one in your love. And that your people who hear your word this day, we your church, we your bride, will receive the love of God, will receive the love of Christ as a substance. That just as Christ was the hypostasis of God, we become the hypostasis of Christ. The very personification of Christ in all the fullness of His love. Take us and, and bring our spirit, souls, and bodies to be in line with Your Word. So that we become the church without spot or wrinkle. We know we will be the transfigured church. Until our very physical bodies are renewed like eagles such that our bodies will not die anymore. Under death and this conquering and the sting of death and sin removed, even from our souls and our physical body. We have been born again. Let the born again power transform our souls and our physical body. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. So right. <laughs> <laughs>
Now may the revelation of the love of God as be unfolded to you this day. Take hold of your hearts and your minds and your soul. May you never forget this word of your high calling. The call to be the personification and the substance of the love of God. For there are many yet challenges ahead for every single of your life, every single one of your lives. And you're as individual as a love of God as that God is writing a love story in your life. And your love story with God is a special story that only you will have. As special as a digit in pi. You are the love story of God. That God in His manifold wisdom will show to every individual one of us a different love story. That your love story will be unique as the digits in pi. Because the love of God is so great that the whole universe cannot contain. And He need every single digit and unique individual to express His love. So this is your high calling. And may this revelation of God be upon your life. And though you may face many challenges, you will have your green pastures and still waters. But though you face challenges of mountains and valleys and even the valley of the shadow of death, no one thing surely that God will never let go of your hand. That His love never ceases. No height, no depth, no principalities, no powers, no angels, no things to come, no things in the past, no things unseen can separate you from the love of God. Because God is writing His love story in your life. Let Him write that love story. Even when you tread through the wilderness, God says, I have loved you. Even while you few in number. He told the Israelites, He was writing His love story for them. He writes His love story in the life of Moses. A love story in the life of Elijah, Samuel, David, the prophets. A love story in the life of Paul, who did not know God. But when Paul knew God, he started writing a powerful love story. Where Paul says, for the abundance of love, he wrote his epistles with tears crying down his face. He's writing his love story for you. And the greatest love story is that it is yet to be finished and written in the story of the glorious church which all of you are a part. Let him finish his story. Resist him not. Yield to his love. There will be times where it might be difficult to love. But always choose God and choose the way of love. It is the right way. Always all the time. For there is hope there is faith. But the greatest is love. And love never fails. So if you have the true love of God, you will never fail. Those who fail on your left and right and drop out, whether draw out of church, draw out the Christian life, backslide, you know what fail? Their love fail. So as long as you're in the love of God and walk in the love of God, the love will never fail and you will never fail. So know that from now and as you walk through times of darkness coming to the earth, as you walk through the coming seven times seven year cycle, love never fails. It will bring you all the way to the glory of God and the truth. Seal this revelation, Father, into each heart and mind. So that we are a people 
would never fail. Because love never fails. Though the world fail and people may fail around us, we still choose to walk on with you. And we never fail. Because love never fails. In Jesus' name, seal this truth. Amen. Praise God. Give you a good